Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Wait, I just feel the energy in that morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is an energy forum after all, am I right? <laughs> Welcome to the CARICOM Development Fund's Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Forum. Now, RE or Renewable Energy and EE for Energy Efficiency is today being driven in an effort for small and medium-sized enterprises to capitalize on it in order for them to reach the market, whether that's locally, regionally, or of course, internationally. Hello, once again, my name is Miss Ronisha Gentle, and I am elated to be your host for this event. The first order of business, though, is the St. Lucia National Anthem. So if you could please kindly stand. I now call on the Venerable Archdeacon Christian Glasgow to bless us all before we proceed. <laughs> in the Genesis, in the beginning, Genesis, in the beginning, man was created to be co-creator and caretaker of God's creation with God. And as such, our task was and is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation, to renew and sustain the life of the earth. Let us pray. The name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we give you thanks for all those who collaborate in efforts to safeguard the integrity of creation. We are especially thankful for the CDF and their work in renewable energy and energy efficiency. As we come together in this forum today, it is our prayer that all who participate, we do so with a sense of urgency and a sense of uh, the importance of this hour. Father, we pray that even as new hopes are raised, that they will be sustained by having the various support structures assisting and working to nurture such hopes and to bring them to fruition. Father, it is our prayer that all things done here today would work in a collaborative manner so that the integrity of this creation will be maintained and together we'll seek to renew and sustain the life of this earth, our home. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for those words of blessing, Archdeacon. 
And now, of course, I have to take this time to acknowledge our protocol for this morning and give a special welcome to Senior Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Port, Transport, Physical Development, and Urban Renewal. <sighs> okay, Minister, has anybody ever told you that your portfolio is very heavy? <laughs> and very wordy, but I'm sure you're doing a very good job. <laughs> Also, I would like to welcome and acknowledge Mr. Rodinal Sumer, CEO for the CARICOM Development Fund. Good morning. Also, Ms. Selena Chang, Deputy Counsel for the Embassy of China, Taiwan. In addition to that, of course, our Archdeacon, Christian Glasgow. Thank you once again. And a warm welcome to our special guests and presenters, Dr. Allison Jean, Ms. Cheryl Wen Renwick, Mr. David Bristol and Mr. Cornelia Sidoni. Now, for some quick housekeeping, please be advised that refreshments in the form of coffee or tea is directly behind you, and feel free to take part in it throughout the course of the morning. Now, to start off the order of events, I now call to the stage Mr. Rodinal Sumer, Chief Executive Officer of CARICOM Development Fund to give us a few remarks. Mr. Sumer. Thank you, Mistress of Ceremonies. And you did say a few remarks, so I might have to ask you to bear with me a while <clears throat> because these are a bit more than a few remarks. But before I get into my formal remarks, um, uh, let me acknowledge members of the uh, stage, had, uh, st seated on the stage. Uh, the protocol has been established, let me adopt it, but also to say uh, it's really a pleasure to have the minister here with us today to help to set the stage in terms of uh, policy direction uh, for the government of St. Lucia, which is important for the success uh, of the initiative that we are about to, to, to share with you um, through these remarks and throughout the day. Let me also um, acknowledge the partners of this, this facility that you'll find out more about as we go along, uh, the banks that have signed up to the credit risk abatement facility of Kraft. Um, the SMEs that have already benefited from the facility. Um, hopefully they will serve as uh, an example and an inspiration for those of you who are interested uh, to, get, uh, to get on board with renewable energy and energy efficiency. Also to acknowledge members of the media and for all business owners and managers who have turned out in such large numbers to this forum uh, organized by the CDF. So I want to thank you very much for making the time to attend today's event, which seeks to expose participants to an exciting offering in the renewable energy and energy efficiency sector of the region. And that is the credit risk abatement facility, which we call CRAF, uh, which is, has been developed and launched by the CARICOM Development Fund, the CDF. So permit me firstly to briefly place this initiative in the context of the rationale for and the purpose of the CDF. The CDF was established uh, pursuant to Article 158 of the Revised Treaty of Chagaramas to provide technical and financial assistance to countries, regions, and sectors that are determined to be disadvantaged among other reasons, by the implementation of the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, the CSME. So by addressing or preempting those situations of disadvantage, the CDF, through its program activities and product offerings, promotes greater economic and social cohesion within the Caribbean community and thereby strengthens the platform for deeper and more beneficial regional integration. So what we're about to discuss today falls within that framework, and we'll, I'll explain, and it'll become evident to you, hopefully, 
how they fit together. Among other capacities, this mandate of the CDF orients and empowers the fund to address the developmental needs of both the public and private sectors in the pursuit of the core objective of addressing economic and social dislocation. Since the inception of our country programs in 2010, the CDF's interventions have been geared in accordance with the CDF agreement towards three broad areas. Firstly, addressing structural diversification and infrastructural development needs. Secondly, facilitating regional investment promotion and mobilization. And thirdly, facilitating business development and enterprise competitiveness. So those two last thematic thrusts that I mentioned, facilitating and mobilizing investment uh, at the regional level and enabling enterprise development and competitiveness are being significantly advanced under, under the operational mandate of the credit risk abatement facility that we will be presenting to you today. CARICOM member states in delivering on their climate change priorities must engage the private sector, particularly small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, but we know that these enterprises face several challenges in the thrust to invest in renewable energy technologies and energy efficiency measures among other areas. One uh, such challenge is the lack of access to financing. The strengthening of access to financing for SMEs, in our view, should be accelerated by encouraging the financial sector to become a significant player in providing appropriate financing options. As we see it, the involvement of financial institutions is imperative if we are to reap the commercial and developmental benefits of a sustainable energy sector that holds so much promise for us in the region through increased domestic investment and improvements to the competitiveness of businesses. But in our consultations, um, you know, it was, it was clear to us, and I think it's considered to be more or less common knowledge, that there's a certain hesitation in the financial sector to participate in this area. Uh, critical impediments to that participation are the high risks associated with servicing SME credit compounded by the lack of knowledge in underwriting loans for projects related to renewable energy technologies and energy efficiency measures. To address these gaps uh, within the sustainable energy space, and these were identified through various stakeholder consultations and surveys, the CDF's craft addresses the entire ecosystem of key stakeholders and is aimed at building the market on both the supply and the demand sides. To this end, the craft is a creative solution, and I would, I would describe it as a total solution, aimed at incentivizing financial institutions to provide additional lending or incremental lending to SMEs for RE and EE initiatives, not only in St. Lucia where we're doing this event for the first time, but throughout CARICOM. In St. Lucia, there are currently two local financial institutions that have signed on to the CRAF. These are the St. Lucia Development Bank and the Bank of St. Lucia. We are currently in discussion with other financial institutions and hope to onboard uh, more of them very soon. At the regional level, the Caribbean has committed to reducing its reliance on fossil fuels as a source of energy and embrace the use of renewable energy sources such as wind, biomass, and solar which are in abundance in the region. St. Lucia, through its updated national determined contributions, for example, has committed tra to transition to a low carbon development strategy and strengthen its resilience to climate change. Initially, the cost of conversion to renewable energy technologies was somewhat prohibitive. However, these technologies have seen notable decreases in cost, leading to significantly lower capital needed to invest in new systems. So we have a uh, uh, an opportunity now to take advantage of the, these cost reductions to give a boost to investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency. I 
as, as I've indicated earlier, financing renewable energy projects remains a major challenge for small businesses, both in St. Lucia and the wider CARICOM region. And in, in, even in instances where financing is readily available, there is a lack of sound and bankable projects or proposals that can stand up to the rigors of the requirements of financial institutions. So we need a combination of things, dedicated financing, along with risk reduction measures, which would lead to increased investments in these projects. The CARICOM Development Fund, recognizing this challenge, sought to fashion this solution that uh, has evolved into CRAF, uh, focused on the energy sector, where SMEs are particularly vulnerable to high energy costs due to their dependence on fossil fuel power sources. The objective of the facility, when we were thinking it through, is to implement a private sector driven and market based approach towards promoting investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, the development of this facility, um, which in certain respects or certain aspects of it um, would not be new to you or to the region, um, took over three years of dedicated work amongst all stakeholders in the region, financiers, SMEs, regulators, specific regional institutions and, and service providers, a cross-section of which are represented here at the local level today. The craft was launched in November 2020 and its primary focus is, is to incentivize additional lending from local financial institutions to the private sector. Uh, and it covers interventions in all productive sectors, particularly agriculture, manufacturing, and tourism. And the key objective of the credit risk reduction framework is to encourage financial institutions, commercial banks, development banks, um, uh, as well as other financial institutions uh, to lend to small businesses with, and that includes credit unions. In fact, in some countries, credit unions uh, play a more major role than, than the commercial banks and development banks. To lend to small businesses with viable projects and um, businesses that have good prospects of success, but which are unable to provide adequate collateral or which do not have suitable records of financial transactions to prove that they are credit worthy. Um, we will hear much more about the details of the craft uh, through, through the presentations that will follow, but I just want to give you a, a broad uh, indication of, of how it is structured. The craft comprises three targeted interventions, a credit risk instrument, a technical assistance program, which, is, uh, which we are going to focus on a lot today, and a monitoring and evaluation framework. In short, we have tried to bring together all the players, all the key players in one space, which is why I describe it as a total solution, to improve access to finance and to improve the quality of projects so that we'll have a much greater uptake of renewable energy and energy so, uh, efficiency solution. So this project identification forum today, hopefully will uh, bring the aspirations of many of you uh, closer to reality. In particular, uh, this is important for us to, to emphasize, the CDF is targeting women um, entrepreneurs and women operated businesses in keeping with our gender e uh, equality policy. The fact is that women owned and managed businesses in St. Lucia, as is the case across the region as a whole, contribute significantly to the economic landscape of the country. Today, we are bringing the opportunity to you. So we urge you to engage with the craft personnel within the CDF that are, that are here today. We will be considering your proposals with a view to moving them to the next stage whether through the provision of technical assistance or facilitating access to affordable finance that is already available in the system. So our personnel will be on island for a few more days and I think some of you are already aware that we are in the process of um, scheduling visits to your establishments where we can meet with you and, and, and get the ball rolling. What we hope to be able to do after this is to generate a very solid pipeline of projects that will go through the financial system, particularly through the onboarded craft financial uh, institutions. So the next time we meet, we can speak of, of the successes, how many projects we were able to, to stand up um, under the craft 
in St. Lucia, how many we could, would have been able to support through technical assistance and through loans and, and through credit risk support through the banks. In closing, uh, I'm particularly pleased that this project identification is being rolled out uh, initially in St. Lucia as we seek to strengthen our sustainable energy program with the government of St. Lucia. In that regard, I'm particularly encouraged by the presence of Minister Stevenson King, who is the Minister responsible for energy, and other representatives from the ministry and public, public sector in St. Lucia who have policy and regulatory level responsibility. And of course, most importantly, all of the business owners and managers that are here from the private sector, because this is really targeted to you. You are the ones that are going to drive this facility and to ensure that it is a success, not for us, but for yourselves and for, and for the region. Last but by no means least, we are excited about the future as we seek to address the various gaps, the knowledge gaps, the information gaps, uh, the financing gaps um, that uh, slow down the implementation of renewable energy and energy efficiency projects and programs in St. Lucian across the region. And to do so, it is the CDF's intention to have similar forums in the majority of our other member states. So we hope to learn a lot from our engagement with you, and hopefully we can showcase this uh, forum as a success that we can build on. So I thank you for your attention and wish you all a productive engagement at this Project Identification Forum for Sustainable Energy. And please you know, feel free to engage us as you need to so that we can help you advance your projects uh, in the sustainable energy space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Sumer. Pop quiz. This mandate of CDF on the craft is the revised version of what treaty? I'm, here, I'm, here, ch -ch -ch -ch, I'm hearing it. Okay, there we go. All right. One more time for those who didn't get that one. What year was the credit risk abatement facility launched? Y'all sharp. I can't handle y'all. <laughs> now let's give a not so hard test. We have here today two polls that we would like you to participate in. If you look on the screens, you will see a QR code as well as a very short website that you can log into. So the first option is to scan the QR code and you will have direct access to the poll, which consists of three short questions. Alternatively, you can type in slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the pin pound sign 2185926, and that will lead you to the questions as well. We will take a few minutes to complete that, and you will see live feedback from the responses. No cheating. And of course, answer honestly and candidly. So the first poll question asks, what is the main barrier to the implementation of energy efficiency, or EE, and renewable energy, RE, solutions in small and medium enterprises in St. Lucia? So basically, what challenges do persons in the small and medium-sized enterprise on the island have for implementing energy efficiency and renewable energy within their organizations, business plans, business concepts. We still have a few people putting in their answers. I see we have a very far lead for one particular answer. And can I get from my moderator if there are any more answers still trickling in?
thank you everyone for participating and to give a quick recap we have access to financing at 74 percent ah wow i i think that is a common denominator in green energy sustainability and every other aspect when it comes to starting up a small business in second place we have lack of awareness of the benefits of re and ee solutions and this is where this forum comes in to gauge your and interest and see how best the cdf can thrust it forward in ensuring that all relevant parties get on board third we have limitation in the regulatory framework 29 28 percent i'll touch on that and lastly we have lack of technical expertise and i believe mr sumer rightfully mentioned that we have our technical staff here on duty today to get that started now doubling back on the third item lack of awareness of of the benefits of re and ee solutions once again that is also available here for you today and the limitations in the regulatory framework now shifting to that tide we have uh dr allison jean um to give us a bit more insight jean okay guys so i have to make a disclaimer the french is killing me over here in the oecs so please forgive me for my belizean accent not allowing me to properly pronunciate and enunciate those french words <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> Dr. Alison Jean. Okay, there we go. <laughs> the Chief Executive Officer of the National Utilities Regulatory Commission. And she will be giving us a bit more insight on how our utility stakeholders and partners can, of course, be incorporated in initiatives such as this one. Dr. Jean. Good morning, everyone. I wish to um, acknowledge the presence of Honorable Stevenson King, my parliamentary representative and senior minister in the Ministry of Infrastructure, Ports, Energy, Transport, Physical Development, Urban Renewal, and every other, everything else, meteorological services and all of the above. Yes, I need that energy, public utilities, telecommunications. My presentation this morning will focus on the advances that have been made um, by St. Lucia on renewable energy and the energy efficiency sector to stimulate investments among small and micro enterprises. And as I start off, I wanted to look at the evolution of the enabling environment for electricity in St. Lucia. So it starts off with the Electricity Supply Act of 1964, which granted our current utility, which is Lucilec, an exclusive license to generate, transmit, distribute, and sell in electricity for 80 years from July 1st, 1965. As we moved on, the Cabinet of Ministers approved a sustainable energy plan with one of the goals being to enhance security of energy supply and use of all sectors for all sectors of the economy. However, successful implementation of that plan was impeded by the absence of the appropriate regulatory and policy framework. In 2010, the cabinet came back and approved the national energy policy, which sought to create the regulatory and institutional enabling environment for the introduction of, in, of in, industrial indigenous, sorry, renewable energy to the national energy mix and also to achieve greater energy security and independence. The 
The national energy policy also sought to and um, pursue the procurement of energy supplies at the least cost through liberalization of energy, of the energy sector and, the, and broad private sector participation. So that's where you come in as SMEs. Again, energy security and reliability, diversification of the energy base, exploitation of indigenous renewable energy resources, sought to achieve higher efficiency in energy production, conversion, and use of the overall objective of reducing energy intensity, reduction of adverse environmental effects and pollution by rehabilitating existing energy sector facilities and introducing new standards for energy-related products as well as mandating appropriate environmental impact assessments of new projects and options. Further to the energy policy, and that for me, I think, was the linchpin for the advancement of um, incorporation of renewable energy into our generation mix. The government of St. Lucia pursued what was called the Eastern Caribbean Energy Regulatory Authority, ESERA, by collaborating with the government of Grenada to serve as a regional regulator. That initiative was pursued with the other Caribbean countries, but unfortunately, um, only St. Lucia and Grenada signed on. ESERA as an authority was changed to a regulator's agency, while both countries created national regulators. And um, that's the reason I did not introduce myself after Madam Mistress of Ceremony, um, because now I could tell you about the National Utilities Regulatory Commission, or acronym NUC, um, which is the regulatory body in St. Lucia for energy, water, and sewage um, services. So NUC was born by an act of parliament, number three of 2016, to serve as that economic regulator for water, wastewater, and electricity service sectors in St. Lucia. A license, the license that was granted to the, the utility or LUSELEC, according to the legislation, was to generate electricity using fossil fuels only. So if you remember, I said initially that the company was given exclusive right to generate, transmit, distribute, and sell electricity but the act of 2016 reduced the generation to fossil fuels only. And the Electricity Supply Amendment Act, number two of 2016, required that all electricity um, generated from renewable energy would now fall under the authority of the NUC. So Lucilex exclusivity is for the gen generation using fossil fuels only. And that means no other entity or individual can generate electricity from fossil fuels. But renewable energy generation is open to all and falls under the direction or the regulatory authority of the NUC. The government of St. Lucia in 2018, um, cabinet approved the National Energy Transition Strategy, or what is called a NETS, and it specifies the results of an analysis and strategy by defining the techno-economic opportunities, pathways, and imp implications of energy transition established through the creation of an integrated resource plan. And as you would see on the screen, the results of the 
research that was carried out um, sought to identify the least cost option for energy generation for St. Lucia as we transition from renewable energy from um, fossil fuel onto renewable energy. I will not go through all, but the recommended approach at that time was for there to be a combination of centralized solar and wind with um, a penetration of about 38.9% of renewable energy onto the system by 2023. We're in 2023, and uh, um, we have not gotten there yet. But there is still good news on the horizon. The government has been reviewing, consulting, and pursuing the draft electricity bill um, for some time now. And that bill sets out the functions of the commission on the provision of electricity services, these functions are related to the licensing of electricity service providers, technical and economic regulation of the sector, conducting public education programs, providing advice to the Minister for Energy, and dispute resolution between sector stakeholders. And so, from the draft legislation, we can already glean, or in fact, the amendment legislation has already pursued the unbundling of services of generation, trans transmission, and distribution of electricity. Um, it also allows for entrance into the sector. So when the new legislation is enacted, you have opportunities as investors to become independent power producers or to be able to install larger systems um, on your property in order to take advantage of the indigenous um, resources of solar or wind um, as the NETS prescribed. I could say um, that the government is at this time doing a review of the IRP, um, well, it's in integrated resource plan, and now um, it's going to be an integrated resilience and resource plan. And so that will determine the amount or the, 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 the yes, the combinations that would be, the combinations of resources, generation resources that could be added onto the national electricity grid. From the, the draft legislation, there is also provision for competitive bidding for new generation. And we seek to um, pursue our nationally determined commitments, which stated that we should achieve at least 35% renewable energy onto our grid by 2025. So what are the perspectives to unlocking the capital investment? I'm sure that's what you're eager to hear. I believe the first thing that must be done is for the electricity legislation to be en enacted, the new legislation, because this is going to open the window or the door to you as small and medium enterprises unlocking that potential that we have in our country for renewable energy because we do not um, have oil. We have to import um, fossil fuels. We see the volatility of the, sec of, of the, the, of, um, the world market. And so if we are able to pursue what we already have on our island, then that will be a tremendous um, progress towards getting you to achieve your bottom line. And I think for all of you in the room, that is your main focus. There is need. What we've done in the, in the NERC is to 
do several studies that will assist us in preparing for the enactment of the legislation. And just recently, we conducted a public consultation with our various stakeholders on what would be the optimal capacity limits for domestic, commercial, and industrial sector. I must say that I have gotten some very good comments. I only received, I received the last week comments from the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association, and I am awaiting comments from other major sectors, especially the private sector. Um, the other thing that we also discussed at the public consultation was the energy pricing methodology that ought to be applicable for St. Lucia. That means right now, for persons who have, or, or entities that have been connected um, to the grid through the RE photovoltaic systems, the solar pho photovoltaic systems, they're doing it with the utility on a net metering basis, which means that whatever price you pay for electricity is the same price you sell the residual power from your system. But this, as we know, is an unsustainable um, methodology. And so, again, we're putting it out to consultation, what you believe should be the applicable methodology, whether it be net billing, gross billing, feed-in tariff, buy all, sell all. These, this is out for discussion right now, and we invite your comments on what ought to be. The, we, we, we eagerly await um, the entrance of independent power producers, and that means that you can have utility, um, solar, or wind, and sell into the loan utility company. There are other provisions for procurement procedures and power purchase agreements and incentives to investors, I believe, will assist in unlocking um, the potential. There is, again, the reason that we're here, looking at financial institutions that would make capital available. And as we're told, um, the St. Lucia Development Bank and the Bank of St. Lucia, who we deal with very closely, they have already been able to provide facilities for that. Um, our land use policy should also be reviewed because solar takes up large land space and you wouldn't want in 238 square miles to um, have to give up so much land space in favor of these solar panels because there's a competition with various sectors for that same land. And of course, I believe that our utility should be focused on grid maintenance and grid upgrading to take into um, account the intermittencies that will be prevalent in the, during the time when um, we have a higher penetration of renewable energy. I thought that since we have small businesses here, but I know that my time, I'm already getting a cue that I have to stop. But just to let you know the application process, I will not go into it, um, but if you need further information, you could come to the NUC. But I just want to highlight that before you think of purchasing your solar PV system, please put in your application to the NUC before you import that system, because you may encounter difficulty with your system specifications being incompatible with the national system. And so we advocate and we advise in accordance with our guidelines that you ought to um, seek approval um, for your PV system before coming, before going to pursue, to order or, or import your system. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I will stop here and invite you to give us a call um, or send us an email um, at the National Utilities Regulatory Commission. We're located in Sanssouci in the yard that has Flo, Carilec, 
and some other organizations. I thank you. A special thank you for those remarks, Dr. Jean. In this portion of the agenda, let's welcome an address by Ms. Rosemary Pierre-Louise, Director of Investment Coordination in the Ministry of Commerce. Thank you. thank you, Madam Chair. I wish to adopt the protocol already established. However, I want to recognize the presence of Honorable Stevenson King and members of the head table. As I look around the room, I see some very familiar faces. Um, Mr. Brian Luizzi, um, other government officials, senior members, um, Mr. Medford Francis, my go-to expert on matters relating to energy, Mr. Terence Gillard. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me first apologize on behalf of Honorable Emma Hippolyte, who would have loved to be here. Um, I think we can all agree that she's very passionate about her MSMEs, and so I apologize on her behalf. She really could not be here because she's out of state. Um, just by show of hands, how many business owners do we have there? Our micro and small business owners, are you all here? Or I, here we go. And I'm assuming that many more are tuned in virtually because we did send out the invite to them via um, Neo Sarah. So my apologies, but I will not be speaking to our non MSMEs. My focus this morning will be to speak to our MSMEs. I'm, I'm sorry, I may sound biased, but as a representative from the Ministry of Commerce, I want to ensure that they understand clearly what is being discussed here this morning. As the Ministry responsible for commerce, manufacturing, business development, cooperatives, and consumer affairs, we are extremely passionate about the success of our micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Our MSMEs form the backbone of our local, our local economy. Collectively, the impact and resilience are undeniable. However, complaints about limited access to finance, compounded by the burden of high electricity costs, continue to feature prominently during our side visits to businesses. Our businesses, especially the manufacturers, recognize the benefits to be derived from making the transition to cleaner energy sources. However, the current financing of renewable energy and energy efficiency projects is hampered by several factors. And we saw that this morning on the screen, a perceived lack of demand from SMEs driven by lack of access to finance, limited understanding of the technology and potential long-term cost savings that can be achieved through such interventions, a relatively underdeveloped local market, lack of collateral resources by SMEs and limited risk appetite among finances to extend credit to SMEs for such interventions. Economic experts estimate that MSMEs represent the lion's share of businesses in the Caribbean and Latin America, and collectively are among the region's strongest drivers of economic development and innovation. However, it is not surprising that according to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, MSMEs in this region receive only 12% of total credit. Less than half the share received by MSMEs in OECD countries. And only 17% of MSMEs in the region use bank credit to finance short-term working capital 
compared with 29% of large companies. Further, 22% of MSMEs use long-term bank credit for fixed asset financing, compared to 34% for larger companies. As a result, these MSMEs tend to remain small and considerably less productive. Today, we welcome the CDF's Credit Risk Abatement Facility, CRAF, to St. Lucia, as the CRAF seeks to overcome these barriers through an integrated approach by providing a credit risk guarantee to financiers and a targeted technical assistance program to build capacity among SMEs. And we heard from Mr. Suma, it is an all-encompassing initiative. We hasten to acknowledge, however, that SMEs financing issues arise not solely on the supply side, but that, that there are demand side issues as well, both in terms of the reluctance of SMEs to take advantage of external finance and the lack of investment readiness by many of our SMEs. Thus, measures to promote SME finance from the supply side cannot be considered in isolation. We are happy that the CDF's craft is going to fill these gaps in the credit market, thereby allowing for the transfer of risk away from the primary lender and unlocking much needed capital to finance viable renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. Specifically, the craft will provide an incentive for additional lending to small and medium-sized entities for these projects in the Caribbean. The Ministry of Commerce welcomes efforts towards this end. In keeping with the national energy policy, we are committing to working collaboratively with the department responsible for energy to ensure that all major consumers of electricity undertake energy audits to assess energy consumption and implement energy conservation practices. In March this year, in commemoration of World Consumer Rights Day, the ministry hosted a mini expo to encourage the transition to clean energy. This useful one-on-one -on -one information sharing session presented the general public with clean energy options from sellers of LED lights, solar panels, etc., and exposed them to the benefits of making such a transition. It also saw the display of a solar photovoltaic car deployed by the Department of Sustainable Development, which many found intriguing. Some of our SMEs, like the local operator of Latil Falls in Miku, has altogether zero his electricity bill. For him, the benefits accrued were real. There is currently a 100% import duty waiver on new renewable energy equipment and components, and the government also continues to provide concessions on electric and hybrid vehicles. Thus, the Ministry of Commerce urges all SMEs to take full advantage of this opportunity presented here today and to make the transition. And I just want to pause to remind our small businesses that the Ministry of Commerce, together with the Department responsible for energy and the Chamber of Commerce, together with our various financial institutions, we stand and we remain committed to giving you the guidance. Um, our offices are open, so please don't be intimidated. Come in and let us explain and help you so that you can take full advantage of this opportunity. The Ministry of Commerce is heartened by this project identification forum aimed at unlocking access to financing and accelerating sustainable energy projects. We welcome this forum hosted by CARICOM Development Fund to promote the craft. This must be recognized as a decisive move towards the realization of tangible benefits through actionable initiatives. Hopefully, 
This targeted initiative will spur interest and innovation among SMEs looking to break the barriers to entry into the renewable energy sector. On behalf of Honorable Emma Hippolit, we at the Ministry of Commerce are delighted to welcome this Project Identification Forum to St. Lucia and hope that all stakeholders will find it useful and beneficial to their respective needs. I bid you thank you and I wish you a productive morning session. Thank you so much for your presentation and input, Ms. Louise. Now, up next, we have three presentations. First, by Ms. Cheryl Renwick, Chief Executive Officer of Renwick and Company Limited, followed by Dr. David Bristol, the Chief Solar Designer, Technician, and Director of Gearing Up Limited. And this will then be followed immediately after by Mr. Cornelia Sidoni, the Managing Director of St. Lucia Development Bank. Ms. Renwick. <laughs> Morning, everybody. I guess you must be tired of sitting down and listening to everybody talking. So here's another speech for you. But at least I'm one of those that um, I can tell you about what has happened as experiences for, for Renick so far. Um, let me first of all ask, um, adopt the, the protocols already established. But of course, I want to say a special good morning to Mr. King. He has a big portfolio, but he's also our parliamentary rep. That's right. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. A little bit about who we are. At, um, for those of you who don't know us, um, Renick & Company is a 57-year-old family distribution company, which was started by my dad, Chris Renick, on 3rd of January, 1966. We have two large properties in Castries for offices and warehousing, and we also have a full branch in Viewfort. We represent over 100 suppliers um, from all over the world. As you know, our slogan is shopping the world for you. We employ almost 100 team members. We have two garden center shops that we're very proud of because they are um, the ones that are the main agricultural input suppliers. We also have a, a retail store at Renick & Company in Vidbutai, um, where we distribute, where we retail all the products that we distribute on island. So when we started talking um, about energy and looking at the strategic energy efficient goals, these included for us long-term cost savings to become more energy efficient, to upgrade and improve the electrical schematic of Renick & Company. We're 57 years old, our buildings are old. To practice more corporate social responsibility in the fight against climate change, and to prevent losses in the event of grid downtime. <clears throat> in 2018, we started that conversation um, we engaged in the internal discussions with the intentions of presenting a qualified project proposal to the St. Lucia Development Bank, SLDB, recipients of the World Bank Climate Resilience Project Fund. The project was approved by the financial institution. How well do all of us know? Um, the funds are there, but then we were not able, we were not in a position to collect collateralize the debt facility required. So it went on pause. In 2020, um, these lovely people were here in St. Lucia and at um, a meeting at the St. Lucia Bureau of Standards through the Caribbean Development Fund, facilitated a meeting to introduce and discuss the implementation of a pilot project aimed at addressing the ease of and assistance with financing needs of companies wishing to embark on energy efficiency 
projects. At this meeting, along with a few other local companies in attendance, Rennick and Company, represented by our financial controller, Michelangelo, who is in the crowd, took the opportunity to present the details and hurdles of its energy project. Thereafter, the Caribbean Development Fund, represented by its financial controller, Mr. Wayne Vitless, who has been a source of, of wealth, energy for us in our project, reached out for further discussions with the intention to qualify Renick's project as an approved local pilot project. The ultimate aim was to ensure a successful execution of the project through the technical assistance and financial credit risk support through the external partners, Credit Risk Abatement Facility, otherwise known as CRAF. The project was on its way and we were so happy. The approved pilot project afforded Rennick the opportunity to access technical assistance, both with understanding intricacies of moving towards energy efficiency as, <clears throat> sorry, and as well the preparatory processes which would eventually lead us to a viable approach to our financial institution. The two major contributing parties were Dr. David Bristol of Gearing Up Limited, who is here and will follow me with the more technical information on the project. <clears throat> he executed a full energy audit on the company and craft through negotiations with SLDV for a determination of an agreed loan guarantee value. Dr. Bristol was contracted through CDF at no cost to Rennick, and the conclusions of such a report detail all the specifics as it relates, oops, sorry, I forgot to. This multitasking is not my, I think it should be somebody else here. <clears throat> so the report detail all the specifics as it relates to the current usages and wastages, as well as recommendations for resolve and or more efficient and cost-effective cost generation and use. Kraft, on the other hand, ensured the project was kept within the qualifying parameters for classification as energy efficiency. Kraft was also the support function for credit risk assessment and liaison with SLDV to secure required guarantee values. Funding was then finalized in 2021 However, due to the backlash of COVID as it relates to the cost of materials and delivery delays, all contractors engaged for the project had to submit revised quotes, which resulted in a much higher project spend that sent us into a spiral. However, together with everybody, the company was able to rethink and remodel the project to secure Sorry, to secure a reduced overall cost without the compromising of our quality and effectiveness. So coming out of the audit, um, there were a couple of recommendations. Referred, we were referred to a complete rewiring of the two building structures at Vidwitai. As I said, remember, they're very old buildings. The electrical schematic way outdated, causing quite a bit of wastage along along the lines and therefore designing redesign was absolutely critical. The resign of data schematic now includes an additional meter at the main warehouse from the main building that is complete by about 90%. Our number two recommendation referred to a complete switch over of all our lighting to LED. That is about 95% complete. Our third recommendation referred to a replacement of our entire air conditioning system. You could imagine with the buildings that we had, that came at a, almost a fright for us. Using, but we were recommended to change everything out to using more inverter energy efficient units. That is actually 100% complete. Our fourth recommendation referred to the installation of three 
25 kilowatt PV systems. As per the audit, calculation proves that after effective implementation of the above order recommendations, the new level of consumption would require such system in order to be self-sufficient. Installation and internal connections are fully complete. However, the system has not been tied back to Lucilex grid to facilitate the two-way return flow and the usage chargeback arrangement. These are just pictures of the systems that we have put in, the new panel systems and our new inverters. And the following is a picture of the company as it stands right now. The one in the middle with all the solar panels is one of our buildings. Um, we have two buildings, the building to your left, right, <laughs> uh, is also ours. Um, but because of the roof structure, it was recommended that we use one building for all the, the panels. Savings, which is what we all want to hear. Until our solar panels are connected to the Lucilec grid, we will not enjoy and record the true savings potential. However, we have already recorded a monthly savings of over $6,000 for our March 2023 um, energy expense as compared to the same period the year before. Installing the solar panels is completed. Our electrical upgrade, as I mentioned, is 90% completed. Our project is now at a phase to connect to the Lucilec grid. However, we are waiting extensions to our original NOC approvals, which have expired. At this point, I want to say thank you. The project encompassed a vast span of service providers without whom we would not be at this stage. I first wish to thank David Bristol, his son Jack and their gearing up team who worked closely with us for months, maybe years, not even months now, um, to determine the exact solar power fit for our company. While COVID and supply chain challenges caused significant delays to the rece receipt of the equipment. Once received, the installation and connection were completed quickly and without min with minor interruption to our operation. David and his team also worked closely with our electrician, Jordan Regis, and our air condition providers, Precise Services, to ensure each phase was completed efficiently with, again, minor interruptions to our operation. We are so grateful to the craft team and the CDF team for the confidence they placed in us and our project. Their support through the project caused us to fulfill our energy efficiency goal for our Castries operation. Three solution companies were actually identified as the pilot projects for Solution, and although the other companies did not follow through with their projects, we are grateful that Kraft and CDF are saw us through with ours. Recommendation, it has been a long road and we have not reached our final destination yet. However, the journey has been rewarding with very real expense reduction benefits and upgrades to critical aspects of our business. I'm sure everyone in here is searching for improved efficiencies in their business and in eagerness to reduce your energy costs. If so, I can totally recommend the experience, the journey, and the relationships and assistance you can build on here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ms. Renwick. I did notice that a few persons had some questions. If you could kindly write them down and save them until the question and answer segment, that would be greatly appreciated. We now have Mr. David Bristol, who will come up and say a couple words, not a few. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. It's an uh, absolute pleasure to be here, Minister King. Uh, Alison from the NERC, all the friends and the faces that I've known over the years. 
it, today is an exciting day. It's exciting because usually you go to meetings and you hear a lot of aspirational talk. It's exciting when you come to a meeting and you heard something has been done. And I think this is the most important thing. A big congratulations to the, those who had the vision and those who've done what they had to do to get this done. Most important. I want to take you on a, a, a whirlwind tour through our involvement in it and, um, and, and how that went about, because everybody has to go through the same thing. You now don't have to go through the craft thing because that's now established, but the rest of it. So 21st of October, 2019, I, you know, I drive from Viewfort, I live at the opposite end almost near St. Vincent, and um, came to the North to a meeting at the Bureau of Standards, something about craft, and we have many acronyms. And I thought, here's another acronym. And what is this craft about? Credit risk, abatement facility. We met with a, a, a consultant, and um, there were a few of us there, Dr. Isaacs, myself. I uh, can't remember who else was there. Maybe you were there? And, and um, we started this talk, and I thought, oh, here we go. You know, this is going to be another one. Um, but I understood it to be, and I hope it's clear now what it is. It really is uh, based on a, a South African model, if I recall correctly of um, providing security for financing uh, institutions to um, people who want to press ahead with energy efficiency and, um, and renewable energy measures. And um, it sounded like a very good thing. And of course, from 2019, as you know, by March, our country was locked down with COVID. We, we may forget about it, but it was actually quite a challenging time for everyone. Certainly, um, for a business trying to um, move from where they are to using renewable energy and implementing these things, and for the craft to be implemented, um, uh, we managed to get it done. And what that involved was, um, so we were actually contracted by GFA, which was a, a German um, company who were working for another acronym, TABSEC, which is a, which is a program run by the German uh, Technical Corporation. And that stands for Technical Assistance Program for, for energy, um, uh, energy, Sustainable Energy, yes. Sustainable Thank you very much, for that. yeah. Um, and uh, the, the plan was, how do you go about this? And obviously, the technical assistance to be provided was they selected three companies in St. Lucia, where we operate. And um, we were asked to carry out a procedure that would end up with projects that could actually work to measures for these three companies. And of course, these three companies would then go to their lending institution and Kraft would provide the security. So what we did was we did basically targeted audits. We didn't do general audits, but we did what you might call a level one, which is walking around a facility and saying, you need to change these to LED lights. It doesn't take much to say that, does it? You know. So you have that kind of basis, what they call the low-hanging fruit in energy audit. And Cheryl had already started doing that at Rennick, so it wasn't something new, but it needed to continue. And I'll tell you, based on our experience, we had a client in Grenada, and we just did that same walkthrough and told them, change the LED. And the next month, their electricity bill had gone down by $6,000, just from that. So we know the things that work. They're not high tech as such because the technology has been around so long. What is, what is the high tech part is looking at the options that are available now for energy efficiency and the renewable energy uh, options. And you remember, they're not, just, they're not just confined to solar electricity. They also include things like microgrids, energy storage, electric vehicles, because when we think of energy in San Lucia, we primarily use electricity. But of course, other places like hotels, they use LPG and CNG, you know, the, the gases. And of course, people don't think about their fleets. Their fleets also use energy. And our fleets primarily depend on petroleum. So when you look at all of the audit and you look at the solutions, you need to take all these solutions and there are tie-ins between them. In the case of what we were proposing as energy efficiency measures for Rennick were, came down to very simple things. LED lights, we carried out energy logging using a standard certified uh, device that we connected to the electricity supply because your main energy supply is electricity. And we were able to create uh, 
profiles of how they use their energy during the day. And remember, it's really a daytime business, except for the refrigeration and cooling that happens at nighttime, which is minimum. The interesting tie-in and the nice thing is that solar electricity works during the day. And for businesses that operate primarily during the day, it is the ideal thing. And you know we have the best sunshine in the world, so it's taken for granted. And what we were able to do is run various models in terms of systems, including things like electric vehicles in the mix, and look to see what would be the options that would work best. And having done that, we came up with the recommendations. Again, we presented those recommendations to TAPSEC. And based on that, they then presented the information to Cheryl and her team. And the, the other two companies, we did the same with them. And we remember we had a mix of companies. So we had um, Blue Ocean, who do the fish. Um, uh, they obviously a very heavy refrigeration-based company. They, have, they need power at nighttime as well. So solar maybe is not necessarily the only thing they need. They need other stuff as well. And of course, Caribbean grains, which is, you know, is big. I mean, they run lots of electric machines. Their solution was different. Caribbean grains' solution was to upgrade to more energy efficient motors because that's what runs their conveyor belts, their milling, their grinding, etc. But of course, they also have a delivery fleet which you could electrify. So, what we started with Renick is for now, but it's meant to be expandable. So, if they have surplus power, there's nothing stopping them from putting it into an electric vehicle as a mobile battery. So, there is an awful lot that can be done. But the, the process must include proper energy analysis, especially when it comes to electricity, to give you the best bangs for your buck in how you spend that money. So without saying much more, I think the thing is, I'm glad to hear that the NERC is pressing ahead with things I think we all want to see. I think that um, we want to make sure we don't stymie innovation because there's a lot of innovation happening in the world. And remember, whatever happens here, it happens everywhere else. The challenges globally for financing for renewable energy to give comfort to investors is necessary all over the world. So the, all the central banks worldwide have taken up this mantle. So I'm glad to see that all banks have taken it up and we have something as good as the craft. I encourage everybody to try and get as much knowledge today to liaise with Wayne and his team and let us see if we can make one Rennick into many thousand Rennicks. Thank you very much. We all want more to take us higher, lifting our lives with passion we aspire. We want more to dream, to empower people and business, achieving together. SLDB, building a better future, with a strange future. Lucia Development Bank, supporting, lending, developing, building. SLDB. And uh, I wonder who is our next presenter given that video? Yes. Mr. Cornelia Sidoni, Managing Director of St. Lucia Development Bank. Kindly take the floor. Very good morning to all. I wish to adopt the protocols that are already established, but of course, it would be remiss of me if I don't say special greetings to the senior minister and the rest of the persons on the head table. Uh, we all have taken the time, energy, and initiative to be here today to discuss opportunities and financing for renewable energy and energy efficiency. This project identification forum serves as another very important step by CARICOM Development Fund, CDF, to further impact the renewable energy and energy efficiency infrastructure of St. Lucia. As a catalyst for national development, 
providing financing for renewable energy and energy efficiency was automatic for SLDB. Actually, in 2016, SLDB secured funding <clears throat> from the World Bank under the Climate Adaptation Financing Facility to finance renewable energy, energy, energy efficiency, and climate-related projects. In 2020, the CARICOM Development Fund established the credit risk abatement facility, as we were told, and essentially to support the development of renewable energy and energy efficiency in the Caribbean. The CRAF provides guarantees to MSMEs that are unable to offer security for projects of that nature. SLDB cited an opportunity and immediately joined the CRAF as the first financial institution in St. Lucia and the Caribbean to do so. SLDB's vision was to marry the financing from the World Bank at a concessionary rate to the guarantee provided by the CRAF to the benefit of our SME customers. Of course, as you heard earlier, Renwick & Company became the very first company in St. Lucia to qualify for the CRAF guarantee. I must commend Renwick & Company for being proactive in detecting the opportunities and cost savings in renewable energy and en energy efficiency. When Renwick approached the bank for financing, the company did not have professional renewable energy advice, nor did it have an energy audit. And so an energy audit was commissioned with funds and support from CDF, as you heard earlier, to determine the company's renewable energy and energy efficiency requirements. There was an urgent need, of course, to reduce electricity costs, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on the company. The audit revealed that there would be definite cost savings for the company if it implemented the recommendations. With that information at hand, SLDB was able to put together a package for the company, which included, of course, the security guarantee from the craft. We were also able to give them a loan um, with interest rate below the market rates, and we also worked out a grant for them as a total package, and that is the kind of thing that the development bank is there to do, to see how we could work with our customers and provide them with various aspects of um, financing and advice. It was interesting and rewarding working with uh, Renwick and Company and CDF, and we, there were some valuable lessons learned, I must admit. It would be remiss of me if I did not mention our experience with CDF during the process. The general consensus from SLDB staff is that working with CDF on the craft guarantee has been a pleasurable experience. The CDF team displays a high level of professionalism, willingness to assist, flexibility, and agility. They are not invasive, and they do not get involved with the loan underwriting. Through the craft, SLDB was able to benefit from institutional strengthening via various training programs. As our climate adaptation financing facility, the CAF funding comes to a close in June, SLDB is in the final stages of developing and obtaining financing for a new climate finance product. SLDB will be proud to incorporate a green arm into our branding. This component of our offering will seek to provide families, homes, and especially small and medium enterprise businesses with technical and financial assistance for RE and EE projects. We will continue to work closely with CDF and the CRAF to benefit our MSMEs with the security guarantee coupled with competitive and attractive interest terms. You will hear a lot more about this exciting product in the coming months. In closing, I must commend and say kudos to Mr. Rodinal Suma and Mr. Wayne Vitalis and the rest of the CDF team for conceptualizing such an important and transformative product targeted at our SMAs. I thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sidoni.
by any chance would you like to give us a bit more insight as to the name of the green arm that SLDB will be launching? <laughs> would you like to give us a bit more insight as maybe a little sneak peek as for the name of the green arm that SLDB will be launching? Just the name. I think the crowd will appreciate the name. Just the name, right? Yeah. Just a name. Give them a little taste. Green Helen of the St. Lucia Development Bank. So a good round of applause for that initiative. I'm very sure they have some exciting activities and priority, priority areas coming in the next few months. Now we are moving on to the Honorable Stephen King, Senior Minister of infrastructure, ports, transport, physical development, and urban renewal. Thank you very much, Madam Mistress of Ceremonies. Having sat comfortably listening to all of the other presentations made, I thought the keynote address now should be, I thank you. <laughs> because there's so much information which is given, and to some extent which covers the composition of my presentation here this morning. But notwithstanding, I will take the opportunity to recognize those on the platform who have participated thus far in this morning's ceremony. Let me also recognize the officials from government, the head of the energy unit, Mr. Gillard, representative of the Embassy of the Republic of Taiwan, of China on Taiwan, Mr. Medford Francis from the Bank of St. Lucia, other distinguished government officials, distinguished representatives of the Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Brian Luisi and other members of the Chamber, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, members of SM, representatives rather of the SMEs who are here today. I must indicate that I am indeed delighted to have been restored this distinguished honor as keynote speaker and this CARICOM Development Fund Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Project Identification Forum on the theme, Transforming SMEs by Unlocking Finance and Accelerating Sustainable Projects. It is encouraging to note that the that 18 years ever since the establishment of the CDF under Article 158 of the revised Treaty of Shagaramas, the fund remains steadfast to its mandate of providing financial and technical assistance to disadvantaged countries, regions, and sectors. The fund the focal point of the regimes mentioned in Article 142 of the revised treaty was intended to erase the social and economic disparities among member states to engender economic viability through robust and successful competition within the community. Today's event brings into perspective the realization and awareness of the disparities which currently exist in the potential of and capacity for renewable energy and energy efficiency among member states in CARICOM, particularly the less developed countries of the OECS and Belize. This project identification forum is critical and most timely at this juncture, 
and calls for a realistic perspective and analysis of SMEs, awareness, preparedness, and capacity necessary to respond to and venture into the global thrust towards renewable energy and energy efficiency. This is absolutely necessary as we aspire to not only obtain, attain renewable energy and energy efficiency with the hope of reducing our dependence on fossil fuel and by extension energy cost, but more specifically reducing our carbon footprints that should allow St. Lucia and the region to meet our climate obligations as highlighted by our respective nationally determined contributions. A snapshot of CARICOM's indicators reveals that the 20 members and associated members of the Caribbean community, better known as CARICOM, contribute only a small fraction of the global carbon emissions. However, there's, there, there's, some, there, there's some countries, however, these same countries are among the most vulnerable to the negative impacts of climate change driven extreme weather events. Failure to adapt presents an existential threat. Furthermore, the energy sectors of virtually all of the region's countries need to diversify away from the high dependency on volatile fossil fuel sources and promote renewable energy and energy efficiency initiatives. A key element in making electricity systems more climate resilient and less costly must come from commercial and industrial companies, particularly the many small and medium enterprises through their investments in on-site distributed generation systems and energy efficient projects. Renewable energy distributed generation and energy efficiency systems offer many micro and macro benefits to commercial and industrial companies and to countries in the region as a whole. Such systems increase electricity system resilience by eliminating vulnerability and trans vulnerable and transmission distribution lines. They provide cheaper and more reliable energy to commercial and industrial companies, making them more profitable and competitive. And they reduce energy imports and contribute to countries' efforts to meet the Paris Accords targets. However, the distributed generation and energy efficiency markets in the Caribbean have grown at a much slower rate than expected. One major hurdle to the growth of the market for these systems in the Caribbean has been the lack of financing for the hardware. Commercial and industrial companies do not want or may not be able to pay upfront for such systems especially when they are not familiar with the technology. Concurrently, banks are reluctant to provide financing to commercial and industrial enterprises for the purchase of equipment, again, with which they are not familiar without high collateralization. Finally, energy performance contracting companies Developing distributed generation and energy efficiency systems do not have the financial capacity to provide long-term financing to their customers. Besides, there are very few experienced bankable EPC installers through which investors or lenders can channel financing. While the economic driv drivers for such investments remain the impact of the current COVID-related economic crisis will cause further delays in the adaptation of distributed generation and energy efficiency in the Caribbean just at the time when the Caribbean should be focusing on hardening its electricity systems and making its local economies more competitive in the international markets. 
construction and industrial companies, and especially SMEs, throughout the Caribbean will be forced to defer discretionary investments in distributed generation and energy efficiency to refocus on only critical expenditures. The downstream ramifications of this will include, one, CARICOM economies will remain vulnerable to extreme weather events for even longer during a time when extreme weather events are expected to increase. Two, construction and industrial companies will continue to pay high prices for energy, making them less efficient in an even more competitive international marketplace. Three, Caribbean countries will continue to be heavily reliant on important fossil fuels during a time potentially major volatility in market prices. And four, energy performance contracting installers will struggle to stay in business as the market shrinks, potentially depleting a decade's worth of accumulated local experience and expertise in the sector. For St. Lucia in particular, the government has long recognized the need for increasing renewable energy penetration with increased use of indigenous renewables as a key step to building economic resilience. Also, our nationally determined contribution, NDC, establishes a mitigation target of 7% of greenhouse gases emission, gas emissions reduction in the energy sector by the year 2030. Additionally, the St. Lucia National Energy Transition Strategy and Integrated Resource Plan propose a cost-efficient and technologically advantageous electricity generation menu this is in line with the energy market reforms being undertaken by the government aimed at increasing private sector participation in the renewable energy generation market. Our nationally appropriate mitigation actions, NAMA targets, include 20% reduction in energy consumption to be achieved by the year 2025. To achieve these targets, significant strides will need to be made in all sectors of the economy to drive the strategic targets to update renewable energy and energy efficient solutions. Permit me this opportunity to update you on the Renewable Energy Sector Development Project, Geothermal, an initiative aimed at confirming and characterizing our geothermal resource for economic, po economic power generation. The exploration management company or consultancy firm is expected on island very soon to guide the geothermal drilling process. Likewise, government is in the advanced stages of, pre of preparation for pre approval of the Caribbean Green and Efficient Building Project, which aims to decrease energy demand in government buildings while incorporating solar PV and solar thermal applications in a transformation manner. I must also mention government's progressive announcement in this year's budget policy statement to provide further incentives on the importation of solar PV systems and components by removing VAT. While this is significant, we recognize that access to finance remains a challenge. And even in instances where financing is readily available, there is a lack of technically sound and bankable proposals that can stand up to the scrutiny of most financial institutions on one hand, and a lack of understanding to assess the risks of these new technologies on the other. Emanating from the current situation, it is recognized that significant knowledge gaps do exist in the renewable energy and energy efficiency space. The CARICOM Development Fund has created the Credit Risk Abatement Facility, CRAF, to primarily address 
access to funding challenges which has limited the deployment of renewable and energy efficiency technologies in CDF member states. CRAF aims to incentivize additional lending from local financing institutions for renewable energy and energy efficiency interventions. I am aware that the facility seeks to support lending with a focus on small and medium-sized enterprises in all productive sectors with specific emphasis on the tourism, agriculture, and manufacturing sectors. CRAF will achieve its mandate through an ecosystem involving a credit risk instrument, a technical assistance program, TAP, and a robust monitoring and evaluation framework. CRAF, in my view, represents a paradigm shift in the way forward on in renewable energy and energy efficiency and as financed in the region. It allows for a wider spectrum of businesses to access financing for project implementation. Hence, SMEs that would not normally qualify to access loans for renewable energy and energy efficiency implementation are now able to do so as a result of the partial risk guarantee offer as part of the CRAF credit risk instrument. CRAF is underpinned by a cohesive ecosystem which brings together all the necessary players in the space to improve access to finance and the quality of projects developed, all geared at increasing the uptake of renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions. Integral to this ecosystem is the financial institutions which on lend to SMEs using existing liquidity. Also, within this ecosystem are energy service providers, ESPs, and energy service companies who are responsible for implementing bespoke or tailored solutions for SMEs. Fundamental to the advancement and suitability of CRAF is the technical assistance program, which is free to all craft partners in the ecosystem. It is anticipated that much will be discussed later on how to gain access into such facilities. I am undeniably excited over what looms ahead on the horizon for small, medium enterprises and their potential transformation in the renewable and energy efficiency sector. Let me therefore commend the CARICOM Development Fund on this bold initiative and welcome the CRAF Project Identification Program to St. Lucia. I wish you all every success for this event and beyond. I thank you. Thank you so much for those remarks, Dr. Honorable King. And you raise a very good point in speaking about us here in the Caribbean being the ones who impact the environment the least, but we are still yet the most vulnerable to weather patterns and other natural entities that would, as you know, destroy us being that we are so small. So that's why there is a Belizean saying that goes one, one, or crumple the basket, which simply means it takes each and every one of us collectively to make a very strong effort in realizing the opportunities and the advantages of moving to a greener, more sustainable environment and business practices. We now have another poll coming up. As you can see, once again, scan the QR code or type in slido.com and input the pin. And please assist us with providing your feedback on the questions. 
What is the main reason why banks decline loan for renewable energy and emerging energy in St. Lucia? A. Lack of collateral by borrower. B. Borrowers poor cash flow. C. The banks... Ooh, it's going. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> the bank's lack of knowledge of the technology. And I missed one, didn't I? Poor project proposal submitted by the borrower. Those are all very valid concerns of financial institutions, which I'm sure, which I'm sure with the presence of both the St. Lucia Development Bank and the Bank of St. Lucia here today, they can assist you with those once we wrap up with our forum for today. I see it's still going. In the lead, we have lack of collateral by the borrower. Coming in second, as the main reason why banks decline loans for REE is that the huh, poor project proposals are being submitted by the borrower and leading very closely behind in third, the bank's lack of knowledge of the technology and lastly, borrower's poor cash flow. Mr. Burke, do we still have answers flowing in, coming in? Okay, we'll take a couple more seconds. If you haven't assisted us with answering, kindly do so, so we can get a bit more insight. And we are, we're good. So with 45%, answer rate lack of collateral by borrower is in your opinion one of the main reasons why banks decline loans for re and ee specifications in saint lucia now i know prior a lot of you had some questions so we now enter the question and answer segment for the forum i now call on <laughs> I now call on all of you to formulate your questions a bit better. If you have more than one question, write it down because our team is getting prepared to come and facilitate that segment for you. We will have a roving mic, a roving mic throughout uh, the floor to assist you with doing that. Mom, are you allergic to the question and answer segment? Just, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm so just, sorry. Just one slight change. Um, yeah, just one slight change. We're just going to have first a, a video interlude um, for Bank of St. Lucia. And then we'll have a, a quick presentation by the craft team. And then we have a question and answer session. Okay, well, just a subtle change in the agenda. But nevertheless, we have everything coming your way in just a bit. Hi, I am Aleta Ratin Chell, Senior Manager Retail Banking at Bank of St. Lucia. Today, I am here to tell you about the partnership which Bank of St. Lucia has with the CARICOM Development Fund. This partnership entails the guarantee of financing for our small, medium enterprise businesses. This means that you, our customers, can access loans for the conversion and implementation of more sustainable and efficient operations for your small businesses. Bank of St. Lucia is pleased to partner with the CARICOM Development Fund through the Credit Risk Abatement Facility to provide you, our customers, with funding for the purpose of sustainable solution and making your businesses more efficient. We look forward to serving you in the future. Please access our SME officers at any of our branches and we will be happy to serve you. Thank you. And 
And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned just a short while ago, we are now entering our question and answer segment. We will do this as orderly as we possibly can. So with the gentle raise of your hand, <laughs> you, you got me back, eh? <laughs> with the gentle raise of your hand, our team member will walk around with the mic, you ask your questions, and we will be answering it for you. So just just one second. I know you have that question burning deep within. All right. <laughs> but just give us one second. We're just going to make a quick presentation, and then we'll answer all your questions. All right? All right, good. Thank you. Am I the only one who had to adjust the microphone? I hope not. I, uh, protocol having been ex established, Senior Minister Stevenson King, CEO of the CDF, uh, Mr. Rodin Osuma, distinguished guests on, on our platform, invited guests, but most importantly, small and medium-sized enterprises. This forum today is for you. This forum is to address some of the critical barriers that you have been faced with in implementing renewable energy and energy efficiency um, investments in your businesses. And I know you spent a significant amount of time here this morning listening to, to speeches and presentations, and I stand between you and the more exciting part of the forum today, which is actually booking appointments with us to visit your businesses and discuss in some greater detail your project and for us to determine the level or the amount of technical assistance you require and to move with haste to deliver that technical assistance to you. And so I'm pleased this morning to see that you've turned out with brave hearts, high hopes and in massive numbers. But after all the speeches here today, two very critical questions remain that we must answer in plain language. What is in it for you? And when we've answered that question, we must also answer how do you avail yourself of what is in it for you? So we hope very... Um, um, very quickly to answer those questions for our presentation. But in order for us to do that, we must, is that the clicker? Yeah. In, in order for us to do that, we must explain to you what we're trying to do. Earlier on, our CEO mentioned that the CDF's uh, involvement in the renewable energy and energy efficiency space and on the CARICOM wider general um, energy agenda is rooted in our desire to see businesses become more competitive and also to, pro to, to promote their development and expansion. And in doing so, we, have do, we do so through two arms. The first arm provides direct financing for projects, but those projects must go through the government of the country in which those products are to be undertaken. But that's a direct arm. The second arm is to say, listen, we want to create a market mechanism that facilitates and supports the key stakeholders in the, the, the energy space locally to work together and to increase financing for those small and medium-sized enterprises who are vulnerable. And we do so, you heard a lot of talk this morning about an ecosystem. We do so by creating an ecosystem of interdependent players in three main categories. The first is, at the, on the demand side, what we refer to as the, as the main beneficiaries of RE and EE investment. And that is small and medium-sized enterprises. They are the ones with the need. They are the ones who will be left holding the higher cost of energy if they don't make that transition, both for renewable energy and also for energy efficiency. 
So they are the, the first category and the most important category to us. But in order to do that, there must be a category of entities in the, in the market that helps with the technical know-how, that helps to um, put projects together that are bankable and can be considered by a financial institution. And those we refer to as the energy service providers. So when you hear talk of things like energy audits and, uh, and, and solutions to, to, to energy needs and, and things of that nature, these are the ones with the technical know-how now that form part of our ecosystem and, and are important. The third category is the one with whom we consider our counterparties. We sign an agreement with them. And those are the suppliers of finance. The banks and the, the, the financial institutions in countries are sitting on a significant amount of liquidity. And it is time that we get some way to help those financial institutions become comfortable to lend to small and medium-sized enterprises, so small and medium-sized for, for RE and EE. And that is part of our focus here. And that is the ecosystem that we refer to in an interdependent way. So, but you haven't seen CRAF. Where does CRAF come in? CRAF comes in as, you know, that support system on the side. through so three main pillars, helping the financial institutions, helping the SMEs, and also helping the energy service providers through so three main pillars. One, a credit risk instrument. The second is a technical assistance program that is targeted and integrated into the, into the system to help move and drive those projects from concept to market. And Kenrick will speak a little later on about the technical assistance program and the amount of handholding that is done in order to get those projects to a stage where they can be considered. And I will speak a little later on on how we come to close that circle by supporting the financial institutions to, to, to help and to make these investments more comfortable. So this in a nutshell describes or, or you know describes what we are trying to do here, which is the indirect and market mechanism arm of us. It's important. When we leave here today, we're not joking around. We, this is, we deliberately structured this conference to end at 12.30. Enough of the long talk. Time for us now to get your projects. You come to us with the projects. We make a booking. We will come to you because you're business, very busy persons. We're going to come to your, your, um, your, your establishments, discuss your projects, determine the amount of technical assistance you require, and then provide that technical assistance to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning again, everyone. And following on from the protocol already established, I'm just going to highlight to you what this technical assistance um, provides and, and how to access this technical assistance. Again, this technical assistance is not sure. It's free, free of charge. Um, this takes off significant burden off of the SMEs in terms of finding solution for your RE or EE um, projects, right? Um, so CDF will pay for an expert to come to your facility, review your energy use, and devise or help you to devise solutions that you can actually implement at no cost to you, right? Um, and this is available for all SMEs um, that can be guaranteed under CRAF. And I, I, I must kind of explain this, that can be guaranteed under CRAF. Currently, we have two financial institutions that are actually signed on to CRAF. So technically, institutions that want to be guaranteed in the craft has to go to those financial institutions for now until we have other financial institutions that are signed on. In terms of projects that are eligible, um, this must be an SME that um, requires funding to implement. So if it's a case where you have an issue with funding for implementing the project, we can assist there. Um, the project is transformative as it's making a change like aquaponics, uh, um, different technologies that, that is you know, improving what is happening within your workspace. And the project 
without CRAF, the project normally would not have happened. So if it's a case where somebody has sufficient collateral and can actually go and do the investment on their own, then that's not a project that is required for CRAF. So in terms of the technical assistance, there is no maximum amount in terms of what can be provided. Um, the technical assistance, again, is free to all partners. Um, and in terms of the technical assistance, we offer to the SMEs, we offer to the financial institutions, and we also offer to um, the energy service providers. So we are looking at building capacity in all aspects of the ecosystem. Right? And again, it is focused. So we want to have bespoke solutions um, to each of um, our technical assistance. So it must lead towards um, a project implementation at the end. In terms of eligible technologies, um, all forms of renewable ener um, energy, so wind turbines, um, solar, the geothermal, um, sustainable biogas, um, waste energy, all those different sources of renewable energy are actually eligible under craft. In terms of energy efficiency, um, it's, it's solar, LED, I mean LEDs, it's inverter technologies, it's um, variable frequency drives, Anything that helps you to be more efficient in your energy use is also here. We also have it in terms of energy management. So if you're going to install a, a building management system, that also is included. And we also have auxiliary technologies, whether it's batch storage, or if you're looking at combined heat for large um, facilities, that as well too um, is eligible on the craft. Again, one of the things that you're looking for here is solutions, and there are different solutions that will be um, tailored for different industries. Um, as I said, for agriculture, I mean, you have the opportunity for biomass, um, you have solar pumps, um, you have different solutions that will come out specific for the agriculture um, sector. And then you also have, you know, for the manufacturing, for the retail, um, and for the tourism, you have also a different solution, whether it's RE or EE, um, that again will be burned out of the technical assistance. So someone will come to your facility, look at what your energy consumption is, and then develop a solution um, for that technical assistance. How do you access this technical assistance? All right? Techni there, there are three ways basically. We have an online portal that will be up and running in June. Right? So you can, can access that at craft.org. Um, we also have referral from the bank. So if you go to a financial institution and the financial institution see that you have a project, but the project itself needs to be refined a bit further, they can refer you to us um, to assist you with that. And there's a, a golden opportunity today. So if you look in your, your agenda, at the back of the agenda, you'll see a QR code, right? That QR code, you can scan it and you can make a uh, Basically, book for an appointment. What we'll do, we'll take the information, we'll give you a call later today, and we will schedule to visit your facility to do what we call a level one um, audit, just to review what your consumption is, come up with some ideas, and see whether or not you require further technical assistance. All right? Um, if you're unable to actually scan the um, QR code, we'll also have persons at the back that can allow you to actually register for us to actually visit your facility. And as I say, if you have a project and you're having challenges, even if you don't have a project, but you think that there might be an opportunity um, for us to assist you to, to, to decide on what potential project that can be devised for your facility, you can also register and then we'll pay your visit um, while we're here. The visits will be conducted from Wednesday afternoon until Friday evening. So we're here for two and a half days. And if, if the, the numbers are great, then we may have the opportunity to extend um, to providers. So again, um, it's free of charge. Um, there's, I, don't, I can't think of a reason why you would not take up this opportunity. Uh, it's a perfect opportunity, right? And what do you mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you've heard from Kenrick on the technical assistance side we now have to close the circle because it makes no sense that you have an energy audit, you have an energy solution, but you cannot implement it for one or a, another reason, access to financing. 
we are coming around now to see, to close the circle by providing credit enhancement through our credit risk instrument to financial institutions. We are starting off at this juncture with a partial risk guarantee. But there are other credit enhancement products that we will unveil in the future, which will broaden the support that we can give to financial institutions and the incentives we can give to financial institutions that will redound to your benefit in the final analysis. So this credit risk instrument would provide, as I said, a suite of credit enhancement products. And we're starting off with a credit, a partial risk guarantee, where we are, we are offering up to 80% coverage on principal and interest for loans that where the sponsors or the SMEs are unable to provide collateral or they're able to provide collateral, but the bank is reluctant because the cash flow needs a little support. And by implementing the project, it will free up some cash flow in order to repay the investment. That is the two instances on which we would intervene on behalf of the SME. They are available for projects for as, as small as 25,000 US dollars to as large as 750,000 US dollars for some of the larger projects. These are, of course, we, we have taken a broad view of financial institutions. So not only are commercial banks and development banks eligible to sign on as financiers on the craft, but any fund, including energy service companies who have deep pockets or credit unions who are lending to businesses will qualify as a financial institution on the craft. And we will provide the credit enhancement to them. The maximum tenure of the loan should be no more than 10 years. But of course, there might be instances where a compelling case can be made to go outside of that, um, of, of that parameter. And we will entertain it. We are not excluding any sector. So agriculture, you are important to us. Manufacturing, you're important to us. Retail, you are important to us. Tourism, you are important to us. So we will be, um, we will be entertaining all sectors under, under the program. And of course, our facility will be priced in United States dollars, but at a very, very, very concessional rate. And I'm sure that that will um, 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 need some further clarification later on in the question and answer period. But what distinguishes us from other facilities that e exist in the region? One, the ecosystem approach that we've taken. There's no other facility that has taken that. And you know when you have a good thing, persons copy. And I know that there are development finance institutions, international, who have um, 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 copied some of our um, approach. I know that. So that means we're doing something good. So the ecosystem approach, creates a ring of assurance to all of those involved in the ecosystem that they will get support to work. We have bespoke technical assistance program that is integrated into our program to ensure its success. The fact that we've taken a broader view of financial institutions means that the pool is wider for financing for SMEs who may have relationships with any financial institution. And also the fact that we have now decided that through the, 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 the craft that we are not going to discriminate. We are going to be, we are going to build craft with sufficient flexibility to support local conditions because we, we're rolling that throughout the Caribbean, our member states. 
all countries who have signed on to the CARICOM single market and economy will be eligible for, for the craft. And because we are rolling that out as a regional program, we now need to take into account local conditions um, in all of the various countries, and we've built that level of flexibility into craft. So that is what distinguishes us, ladies and gentlemen. We've closed it. So to answer the question that I started off with, what's in it for you? You get, you get technical assistance that you do not have to pay for once. Secondly, you get support to implement your project that will lead to savings on energy costs in your businesses that you could use for expansion and for other purposes. And you have a team that will work with you and handhold you through the process throughout. And with the financial institutions, we will be providing support to the financial institutions to understand those projects, to tailor the financing to the peculiarities of that sector and to better serve you in the end. Thank you. Uh, you answer all the questions? Yeah, that's it. All right, so we're gonna have the question and answer session now. Um, so just raise your hands and there's a Ruben mic that will actually come to you and we provide some answers. Again, I'll ask persons, um, use the QR code. Um, scan it and, and um, make an appointment with us to visit your facility. Um, someone will call you before the end of the day to give you an appointment date. Yeah. Can I go ahead? Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? That's good. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. I'm Cora. I have a few questions. Um, you answered what's in it for me, what's in it for you? is my question. So, so what I'm asking when you do provide me with the technical support, the, all the support that you provide me with, what's in it for you? So CARICOM Development Fund is, a, is a, a regional development institution. What we want to see is our region develop. That is what is for us. So we want to see development in the region. So that's, that's the benefit for us. Okay, do you by any chance get a percentage of the company? My company, so, for example, if I no, qualify? No no no, no. no, 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 we don't, we don't. Your success is Pat, our success. It's, your, it's just yeah, you, your you success, get high of the success of, yes, of my company? Yes, your success is our success, yes. Okay. Yeah. I have a few questions, if that's fine. Sure, sure, go on. Okay. Um, Ms. Renwick. You mentioned the panels and you showed the panels on the building on the roof. I had a question, does the panel cover just the building it's on or it powers other surrounding buildings which are yours? It powers both buildings. It powers both buildings with yes. just the panels being on one building? Yes. Full capacity? Um, we have three. We have 325 kilowatt, but because we're not completed, it, it's a little difficult for me to tell you the full you know, benefits to us, mm -hmm. um, but we anticipate that just from what we've done so far, um, that we should see a almost zero out. But we don't have a battery. That's the important thing to note. Mm -hmm. So anything we're using at night is from the grid. Okay. So if you manufacture, I guess that's the right word, enough during the day, mm -hmm. um, it goes back to the grid and then there is a sort of a, how, how did they call it? Uh, net, metering. net metering. So um, Lucilec would then charge us for what we use at the evening, but the charge uh, credit us for what we, we give in the day. And that's the system that's still being discussed as to how. Okay, and let's say I am renting from somebody, right? Do I need permission from my landlord if I do qualify to get the panels? Certainly. For craft, sorry. Uh, well, you, you, yes, the, the, the short answer to that is certainly. You will need permission to, 
because we don't want a situation, and, and, and perhaps that's a, a question more suited to the financial institution, who would be the one making in the very first instance the decision to lend to you or not. Right. So they would now need to ensure that all of the risks are taken into account. I don't want to end up in a, a situation, I presume, and Mr. Sidoni, feel free to intervene if you need to, um, or, or, or Mr. Mr. Francis, they would need to make sure that they don't install solar panels where you don't have permission, and two or three months down the line, you're asked to remove it and you have nowhere to put it. Right. So that is, that is a short answer for it. But you asked a question a little earlier, and I just want to address one little small aspect of it. Recall our chief executive officer started off saying that the CDF mandate was to assist disadvantaged countries, regions, and sectors. That includes private se the private sector. Okay. So just the fulfillment of our mandate given to us by the heads of government who were specific, who were specific in, in, in developing our mandates to, um, um, for the region, this here is in fulfillment of that, and we are happy to just fulfill that with no benefit to us in the sense of, of uh, monetary benefit to the CDF. Okay, thanks. Um, the panels, Miss. You, you want to respond? Give me one second. Oh, okay, and sorry. I, and I might ask you to hold on to the other question by the time we see some words and hands raised there. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me just respond to her question regarding um, the landlord's authorization. Before you, uh, if you're putting on solar panels, before you could get the financing from the institution, you would require approval from the NUC. And the approval process requires that you either present a land register to show that you're the owner of the property or you get an authorization letter from your landlord um, allowing you to put on these solar panels so that you don't get trapped um, having done it before and then you don't get approval from the NUC. So I just wanted to inform you of that. Thank you. Um, it's on the same subject, so I don't want to, you know, backtrack. Um, is it covered by insurance? For example, if something happens, can it be easily replaced? Is it at any cost to me? Thank you. Yeah, again, that's a question in my view suited for the, the financial institutions to, to respond to in terms of if it's covered by insurance. But of course, just, just um, the, 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 what I would, the, the best approach would be that you have your equipment covered by insurance, but then that would be at your, in my instance, that would be at your, you must have some skin in the game. Okay. Right? So you, everything, if everything is done for you, we invite in moral hazard and we, we don't want to do that. Okay. Okay, question next. Yeah, one question. Yeah. Okay, um, good day everyone. Um, my name is Roxanne Mathre. Yes, so uh, in a case where I recall you all saying that, um, well, Kraft, of course, saying that um, you visit institutions, what if in a case that a business is endeavoring to acquire um, a land space or any other to erect an institution, can that be funded as well? You mean a business that's already established is trying to build a new facility? Yes. Okay, yeah. All of these things that I think, um, Kenrick, in, in the permissible um, projects, that would be included in it because you've already been established, but you're just building out a, a new facility and you want to either make it um, uh, better, uh, more efficient, or you want to generate solar, that's fine, that's included. Eugene. Yeah, go to the back yeah, there, yeah, Good day to all. I came in a little late. Just want to ask a few questions. Um, does CRAF just provide the technical assistance when it comes to the PVs, or is it all around? Do we go to you, say, for instance, okay, I want to get a unit in. Mm -hmm. I'm 
do I go to the NERC first to get approval and to, um, to you, madam, um, do you guys cover standalone units or units that, that have to be connected to the grid? Yeah. Uh we, okay, this is a question. We, that's it, that's and, for yeah, you. To, no, no, in, 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 in one right. small part. The, the, the issue is that we, we, support, we support both off-grid and on-grid on systems. systems. So we, 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 we don't discriminate where that is concerned. Okay. Um, in terms of regulatory requirements, again, the financial institution, remember the decision to lend to you or not to lend to you is the financial institution's own. But we first, don't we would have to go to the NERC to get approval and then go to the financial, ins financial institutions? Is that a, That can saying? be done, in my view, that can be done simultaneously. simultaneously. So it's not a, what I call, bureaucratic process um, in terms of doing that. We, we, we try to do, be as flexible as possible, but of course, you could, you could begin to develop your project, you have it, you could approach the financial institutions, but you will need to get that. What I think um, Senator Jean is, is saying to you is, listen, don't get yourself stuck in a situation where you would have skipped a critical step. Mm -hmm. And when you've come to implement, you realize that you have not done that. So come to the note to find out what is required. Hence the reason right. we're, we're trying not to jump the gun. So we go to her first, uh, or we, we go to the NERC first, and they will advise us as to the steps to take. For instance, what unit you should um, purchase. So if you're ordering a unit. No, I don't. Am, am, I, am I wrong? Uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't get think. No, I don't think. Huh? I came in a little yeah. late, so no, I, I, yeah. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, no, come. Yeah, what we're encouraging is that mm -hmm. you... You go to, you come to the NERC or mm -hmm. you check our website mm -hmm. for the requirements for your application. Um, your system must be UL and IEEE certified. certified. Um, and so before you order that system, you have to ensure that it's compliant. Um, our, the jurisdiction that we have comes from the legislation which mm -hmm. allows for us to regulate interconnected systems. So it means that if you're off-grid, we would not you do even know what you're doing. But we, we try to discourage the off-grid systems. Um, Why? Why? Because we would not know. The electrical department in the Ministry of Infrastructure would not know whether it is compatible with our grid, with the national grid. The safety standards and so on would not be inspected. Mm -hmm. If you do it on your own, then that is fine. But for us to regulate, if you're off grid, we will not know about you. And so if there's any difficulty, that, that which can lead to your property or your system being defective or anything like that, we would not have it. But we're not preventing you from doing it. We're just saying that according to the law, we can only regulate interconnected systems. So the off-grid systems, you guys are not covering the off-grid systems. The law does it not does allow not us allow. to... That is interesting. Yeah, because it is... Why we regulate is because it's, you're interconnected with the national grid. Yes. And we have to protect that national grid. Yes. So the, the whole system of monitoring and inspections um, would, can be, will be done together with the electrical department in the Department of Infrastructure. And, and loose select does their own inspections as well. But if you're off grid and you don't go through that process, then we will not be, I understand we will not know yes, about yes, it. Yes, yes. I, 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 I quite understand. But just one thing, you did mention that loose select has a license to operate for 80 years, right? Yes. So what happens after? I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, no, two things, let me make a distinction here. Don't forget, our program, our facility is distinct from re regulatory facilities, um, the regulatory process. You as the entity would be guided by 
the technical person, an energy service provider who knows the process and work you through that process. Right? So the focus here today is not on the regulatory side. The regulatory side will be dealt with by the energy service providers that you that we that will assist you with the project. Yes, I would like to say good morning to all. Morning. And I must also um, reinforce that the presentations this morning have been quite impactful. Um, in fact, when I came here, I thought that I would be losing a day from work, but it, it's a tremendous occasion, and I, I've learned a lot so far. Um, but, you know, when I came here this morning and I sat, there's one thing behind my mind. I must say my name is Sheldon Winter. I operate a small business. And I came here with one thing in my mind, and that is how to save money on electricity. And I learned quite a bit, but I still find there are some things that were a bit sketchy. Hence the reason for um, the repetition that, you know, an appointment needs to be made so that an assessment can be made on your property, whatever it is, to, you know, determine, you know, what exactly is needed. But I still think that a, a module should have been provided. When I say module, what I mean is that, take for instance, my electricity bill is, I'm being practical, let's say $400. I would like to know in that $400, how much money must I spend on the panel or the, the whole system to eradicate that $400 and how much money I'll be paying over a period of 10 years, as was mentioned, um, to the banks and what, you know, I, I, I like the practical example. So I thought that would have been provided. Well, that's, that's something that we considered. And I think um, you're right. I mean, having that practical example will help you guide you a bit better. So you understand your, your bill, you're spending, as I say, four or $500, um, and what implication that, that will have in terms of what size system you can afford based, based on that um, consumption. And again, as I say, we wanted to make the appointment so that we could have that discussion a bit more one-on-one -on -one in the in the in this discussion in relation to um the persons um before we move on to the next question i think this person here has been waiting a while, waiting a while. so i'll go here first and then we'll come to that next question hi good morning everyone good morning to the head table uh, my question is actually somewhat about the practical example and that was directed at miss renwick you gave the real figure of your savings of about six thousand dollars it was and your march bill could you just give us particularly um considering that you have not done a full conversion as yet uh, what percentage does that figure actually represent so we have an idea of the types of the amount of savings as i say we have not completed and we've done over the period of time we've done different things so we put in the the LED lights, we actually put in a new um, meter at the warehouse. So our electrician had said we were wasting a lot of energy with the wire coming from the front of the building all the way to the back where the air conditioned warehouses were running. Um, so it was being efficient in a lot of the things that we have done. Um, and as I say, we don't know now with the connection of Lucilex. So we've improved what we've done so far, we've improved. To give you an example, last year, our electricity bill for, and that includes Viewfort, um, 18 to 21,000. Last month it was, well, at the end of March it was 12,000. So, and that is, and, and that's why I'm saying, it does not it mean we're not connected to the Lucilec. We're not getting that benefit yet. That savings has come from us being efficient, with the different things that we are doing, plus getting the benefit of the solar panels right now during the day, even though we're not connected easily. But it has varied because different things have happened over a year, you know, different things have happened. So it's kind of hard to say X amount was because of LED, X amount was because of the electrical, X amount was because of the solar. It was a, a package deal. We looked at the entire thing and, and have put in place all these changes. No, I, I have to, I have to Hi. There's a lady who's been hanging Hello. Up for about 15 minutes. Yeah. Immediately after her, we move across to that lady over here, because she's been there for a while. Okay? Yeah. 
Okay. Hi. Um, actually, it was for Ms. Renwick. I'm sorry you sat down before I got to. But it was in relation to what you just said. You said you're not connected as yet to the grid, Lucilec. Um, can you mention what are the difficulties in you getting connected and why, uh, the, why did this happen before you're even able to? It was a process and COVID had a lot to do with it. Um, we did apply to NUC. We had our approvals from 2018. When we actually got to having the discussions with Kraft and so, we, they had expired and they extended it again for us. That was in 2021, I think. Now that the panels are all connected because, because of COVID, there was a major delay in the panels reaching St. Lucia. So once the panels were connected and the inspections were done, um, we then submitted everything to Lucilec to find out that the NUC documents had expired again. So we are in discussion with them right now we don't anticipate, as we've been told, it's within 24 hours we would get it. It's been a little bit more than that because they have changed documents. Um, they want originals. But the point is, it's happening. It's, it's not that, you know, I guess time. But it will happen. That's what they I can go ahead. Okay, I can go ahead. Hi, so my question is, so typically for, I guess, newer businesses or initiatives, the cash flow from that is not immediate. And so your ability to pay back the loan cannot be right away. I haven't seen any, I guess, uh, in that circle, any uh, provisions for persons who are not able to pay right away. And typically, you know, that if it's a new business or a small business, that's something that happens that a business does not generate all the funding to pay back the loan. So is there going to be anything to allow for maybe a grace period before you have to start back paying the loans? Because that's one of the things that has been a difficulty for our business. Right. So as we said earlier, um, in terms of the process of the bank, um, we do not get involved. So whenever you go to, to the bank in terms of that question, the bank will actually provide that information. Again, because we do not dictate who the bank lend the funds to. Like to have, right? Yeah, it's, thank you very much for that question. I think it's, it's quite relevant. Um, we will look at every specific customer circumstances and we will make a judgment call in terms of what you have just asked in terms of a grace period. Obviously, for some customers, um, they can start the payment immediately. Um, for others, it might be a strain. And I just want to say, I want to take the opportunity this morning to really say that this program addresses two critical elements of, of lending. Um, one being the collateral and the second being the cash flow. Okay? What, this project, what is inherent in this project is that you immediately create a cash inflow to your organization through the savings that would service the loan. Okay? So that's one of the compelling aspects of this program for banks. And that, that this is why Bank of St. Lucia sped not even a moment thought in coming on board, because we realize that it addresses two critical elements of lending. And as our colleagues from the craft would have indicated, we really don't see any reason why you shouldn't grab this opportunity. Okay, so to be very specific with regards to your question, we will take all of the factors into consideration. Once you do that energy audit, um, and it, it shows where your savings will be um, generated from, okay, that is very compelling for the financial institution that has to make a judgment call on whether your project is viable. I mean, this is a situation where in, it's almost 100% success rate. Um, so, you know, it's really about the timing and um, your question is very pertinent in that regard. Um, we will take into consideration, what, you know, the period of time that you will need in order to generate a healthy enough cash flow to service um, the loan. So, thanks for that question. Hi, Thank good you morning much. to all. Um, I'm highly encouraged being here today. I've participated in these things for about 30 years and tend to go away shaking my head, but today I'm elated. 
So the bigger piece of the puzzle as it relates to accessing financing seems to be solved. My question really is, um, when is there a timeline to elevating the existing permissible limits of 5 kilowatts domestic and 25 kilowatts commercial? Because to give us the incentive to invest in a big way, these limits are, are too limiting. Absolutely. I, I would invite the look immediately to answer that question. <laughs> Um, like I said in my presentation, there was a public consultation just about two weeks ago where we came to stakeholders to ask um, your view of the optimal levels for um, PV generation, both for domestic and commercial. So we're at a stage where we are accepting comments on the presentations that were made and we will be presenting our report to the Honorable Minister um, who would be the one determining that policy. Um, so within the new legislative framework, we ought to see some changes with regards to these capacity limits. Good day. Uh, my name is Gil. Good day to everyone. Uh, my name is Gilbert Joseph um, from Solar Energy Services Company Limited. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Um, Renwick. Um, the project that um, that was um, ensured to you, did you get the option of going off grid, um, or was the grid side um, was the only thing the option that you had? Because I can see if you look into bring down your your power consumption. Um, I think the, the off-grid, if the off-grid was not um, an option for you, um, I don't know if that was an option for you, if you'd have a look at that. Um, yes, your savings is just below $6,000 for now. Um, <clears throat> but I believe it could have been better, much, much higher, if, um, if I don't know if preparations were made for um, new technologies coming on the market. Um, if, um, the, if you didn't have enough space or you didn't have place to put your batteries. Um, but I believe you could have had a much wider, a higher, a higher. Um, my question is, what was the, the, the grid side um, of grid recommended to you? Off grid is a, I mean, we had a lot of discussions. We spoke to people who have been doing it longs people like ferens i think are the, one of the first um but i'll be honest with you remember our strategic goals we looked at cutting our cost um but also being a good corporate citizen i think lucilec is very important to solution if everybody was to go off grid and there's no need for lucilec then i really think that that is the wrong decision for the island um so it is really about what every single company decides is important to them. For us, it was to cut costs. We don't know what that total is yet, but I've already seen that we're heading in the right direction. Just to speak briefly about the off-grid. Um, at this point, in terms of the cost of batteries and so forth, it's not cost competitive to go off-grid at this point. You're, you're better off um, staying with Lucilec um, at this moment in terms of having it where you, you're you just a, a grid tied system than to be a standalone, especially for large manufacturing systems that have high, high peaks, right? Good morning, thank you. My question is for Dr. Jean, please. Um, did I understand correctly uh, when you said that only fossil fuel um, generation of electricity is regulated 
does that therefore mean that a 100% off-grid um, system, whether it's an individual or a business, could actually sell or share electricity? Uh, or is that coming? I'm not sure I understand your question. The, exclusi the exclusivity is to loose select to generate using fossil fuels. So it means that no other license would be granted to any other operator who is generating using fossil fuels. So that's the exclusive. We regulate, the NERC regulates renewable energy um, generation. So what I said is if you're off grid, then you're not interconnected to the national grid and therefore the law does not prescribe that we have to regulate you. Okay, um, but what I'm kind of asking is that is it coming where an off-grid renewable energy company or individual could share or distribute power with okay. perhaps a neighbor or... Not under the current legislative framework. Is that being looked into? That is what is within the draft legislation. I want to say something about the off-grid systems. If we're talking about a craft facility um, where you are required, where you are expecting to get a reduction in your electricity expenses that would be, um, that you could use to finance your loan, the benefit of grid tide is higher than if you're off grid. Because especially if you do not operate a 24 hour facility, you could be consuming the electricity that you are generating from your renewable energy system during the day, which would bring down your cost. Whatever residual power that you get, especially on a weekend, if you do not, if you do not um, operate on a weekend, that goes back to Lucilec, for which you get a credit. So off-grid, you're only going to be using your electricity that is generated, and nothing goes back. But if you're grid-tied, then during the time that you're generating electricity but not utilizing it, it goes back to the utility for which your, there would be a trade-off. And if I may say, under a net metering system, where you do not have a differential in your buying and selling rates, then you stand to benefit um, a little better with that grid tight system. Um, I have right. So question. we're going to allow two more questions. Um, and those two questions, we'd like it to be non-regulatory. Um, and it, in terms of whether it's a, a finance question or having questions about clarity in terms of what CREF is about. So those two more questions. Okay, well, I have so. one other one about so. finance. Is it um, one per customer? Suppose you have two small businesses. Can that work? Uh, well, it's, it's done per business. So it, it should be um, allowed for two different institutions. Um, executive decision, we will allow a few more questions because executive believes that this is an important part. But as Kenrick said, that we need to, you know, try to make them non-regulatory because the purpose of the forum here today is to deal with the um, technical assistance, to deal with the um, financing and so forth. So uh, we give priority to those questions. So. We'll take your question and then we will take uh, a few more questions. But there's a gentleman in the front who's been asking them a question for the longest while. So uh, um, we will. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question, but we have different organizations that are supposed to be working together, but they all have different rules and regulations. So you apply to Lo Select, you've gone for NOC. They take six months, whatever time, to approve you. Then you get your stuff in, and then you go to Lucilec. They do whatever they do at their time. So if during the time that they are 
you're waiting for them to approve, install, or whatever it is that they have to do. Whatever certificates you have that expires, you have to reapply for them at your cost, although the delay was not yours. And I'm talking from practical experience. So it will take two to three years from installation of your panels to actually being tied to the grid and whatever it is to get electricity. So one, this is a very good initiative, but we need to work out those kinks or else people will get frustrated. Right? Um, so that is just my comment. Without, without being defensive, the NERC's application process, hello, the NERC's application process takes three days. The only time it would take a longer period is if the documents that have been submitted are inadequate. That is the only time. So I think we have to be clear. I must say that I am concerned about the process after it leaves the NUC because we have to be following up on your behalf with the utility and that's where the back and forth goes. Another place that you have a hurdle is when it comes to the inspection of your system by the electrical department. Now again, we must understand that the electrical department is itself a regulator that is doing the inspection to ensure safety of your appliance and your facility. And so it may require that you have to do rewiring, you may have to change your RCDs and several other things in order for your system to be safe. So I think we have to understand the process and the reason for that process being there, it is for you. Now, while I know Mr. Vitalis does not, would like you to ask questions related to the craft, yes, you may jump on the financing, but if the regulatory system or process is not completed, then you will get the hurdle, you'll get the hiccup when you get to the financing part. So let's put everything in proper context. Um, lady, I can assure you, or any other person in the room, if you have any difficulty after three days of sending in an application, you could call me personally. I can assure you of that. Call me personally because it, within recent times, we've been processing applications within 24 hours. We're just given the three days just to make sure that we can have everything handed to Lucilec within that time. But it's usually 24 hours. So if anyone has any problems, feel free to contact me to, to look into the matter. Hi, good morning. I just wanted to bring things back into perspective and... Um, I think they say experience speaks volumes. The, um, first of all, sorry, I'm Michael Andrew, the financial controller of Renwick & Company. The, um, there were two poll questions asked earlier on, and they both led to answers that made reference to financing in, in terms of the client and in terms of the bank or the financial institution. Um, we must realize that at the end of the day, the persons involved or the person that are that are charged with the responsibility of making financial decisions within the company should, to a, to a greater extent, be able to speak and understand the language of EE and RE. If you do not understand it, you will not be inclined to lend at all or invest in it. Um, Renwick and Company, we, we began those discussions way in 2018, and um, we we were not able to stick the financing. And I will explain to you that one of our biggest issues after, after um, having conversations with Kraft and CDF, that it was the technical know-how to, to, to get something viable to the banks. So you may be 
in the position to get it, but how you present it, it needs to be something attractive to any institution that you would like to apply. The NUC, it needs to be something that is fully, fully um, informed. To the bank, it needs to be something that's very attractive as well. So if you don't have the understanding or you cannot speak the language when it comes to EE and RE, it becomes very difficult for you. It, at, in, at inception, it took us very long. And since we met the, uh, we spoke with Wayne and, and Kraft, I think it was Alex, we, it was a very smooth process for us. Um, financing, the, put it in very simple terms. What you save on electricity, you pay much less or you pay less to the loan. So basically you're looking at, in our instance, you may have a, a repayment period of about five years on that loan for the solar. However, at the end of the five years, you don't have the loan to pay and you don't have the electricity to pay as well. So if you look at it in that instance as a short to medium term investment, because it could seem like a very high investment at start, but if you look at it in the medium to short term or the short to medium term, it becomes a, a, a heavy saving on the company. With uh, Renekin, Renekin Company, when we did our first uh, tranche of, of the project, which was the rewiring of the building and the, the separation of the meter and also the AC, um, the transformation for the AC units into inverter units, we were already looking at about 35 to 40 percent of our electricity bill in savings. The, um, obviously, it's only going to get better with the solar panels once we get um, tied to the grid. Um, so just to say that, you know, you all may have a lot of questions in terms of why should I make that investment. Look at it in that way that in the long run, or even in the short run, actually, because it's not a long-term debt from what I'm seeing, it is something that you, 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 you're basically reducing or you're improving on your cash flow because you're paying much less at the end of the day. Um, only to realize a zero cash flow when it comes to year five, which means that you don't have electricity to pay, or maybe minimum, and you don't have a, a, a loan to pay as well. So, um, like I say, it's two things to ensure that the, the persons making the financial decisions are, or speak and understand that language so they'll be more inclined to accept it. And the second thing is to make sure that whatever that goes out to, the institutions are something that is viable and, and marketable, something that looks attractive to them. The banks in our experience, we have had very good experiences with both Banker Solutions and SLDB. SLDB obviously at the time were the only ones that were, were signed on to the memorandum, um, but they were both at the high level of acceptance and willingness to lend. So I would not bash them down, not this time on the, on, on the, on the solar aspect. Thank you. All right, last two questions. This young lady here, and then we have this gentleman across here. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, there are two lending institu institutions. Um, what is the rate of interest um, on the loan for um, this project? And um, the next question is, Lucy Lake, how um, accommodating are they when it comes to um, SMEs? I must say this is a very um, well attended session and very electric in terms of participation. And I'm happy to be here to answer any question as it relates to the bank. Well, when the Bank of St. Lucia um, provided the financing we had, and we still do have, it's coming to an end, as I mentioned in my presentation, we have the Climate Adaptation Financing Facility, the CAF, and the rate of interest on the CAF starts at 4.5%. Yeah, so that's a very concessionary interest rate. But like I said, this is coming to an end and we're trying to put in place um, an additional facility that would be at a concessionary rate as well to be able to continue providing financing to MSMEs to allow them to be able to benefit from the advantages of RE and EE. Thank you. My, my question is along the same lines, but is there a cost to the guarantee itself in addition to the bank's rate? Oh, 
Oh, yeah. So, um, sorry about that. The, our guarantee is pretty much 1% of the reducing balance of the loan on an annual basis. We charge that to the bank. Raise the mic. Yeah. You hear me better now? Yeah. We are charging 1% of the loan, the reducing balance of the loan on an annual basis. That charge is to the bank. How the bank passes it on, whether they absorb it in, in full, partially, or pass it on in full to the, to, the, to the consumer, that is a decision that the bank makes. But for the facility, we're charging 1% of the reducing balance of the facility. And that is extremely small in the scheme of things to help with part, the free part of the operating cost of craft. As you imagine, there's a significant cost where that is concerned. Okay. I think that's it for the questions. Um, yeah. What I would say is that uh, those persons who would like to get additional information with respect to the technical assistance facility can do so as you exit the door on the left, the registration desk, CDF personnel will be there who would be able to speak with you more as well as make appointments for on-site visits to those who wish to require technical assistance. Yeah, just two quick points before I go. One is that um, Kraft now is, is, is capitalized at 13 million US dollars. Um, it is, uh, three of that is for technical assistance. We are currently in advanced discussions with two development institutions who will be providing an additional five million US dollars for technical assistance and uh, $3 million to support the um, credit risk instrument for women-owned and women-managed businesses. We are actually negotiating the, the, the um, contribution agreements with those entities. So at the end of the day, um, very soon, we will ramp that up, our financing, up to about $20 million. So that is where we stand at the moment. And one more point that we wanted to make in terms of monitoring, we are not going to simply provide technical assistance to you and provide credit risk. We have to monitor it. We have to make sure that the objectives of the facility are being met, the key performance indicators that we have, we have, have, have set, how we are progressing towards those, and make the necessary adjustment. And that is done through our monitoring and evaluation pillar. Thank you. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to almost the end of our forum for this morning. I now call on Mr. Arden Warner. He is the legal counsel for the CARICOM Development Fund to give the closing remarks. Thank you very much, Renisha. All group protocols being observed Distinguished guests of the podium, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, good day. Thank you very much for making the time to attend today's event, which sought to expose participants to the types of technical assistance offered by the Credit Risk Abatement Facility, CRAF, as it is now known to all of you. Just a reminder that this facility seeks to incentivize domestic lending by local financial institutions to SMEs for renewable energy or energy efficiency projects. As our CEO, Mr. Rodinal Suma indicated earlier, this technical assistance facility is provided free of charge to SMEs and other service providers. Let me specifically thank the Honorable Minister of Renewable Energy, 
the Honorable Mr. Stevenson King for his participation today and his presentation this morning. And more importantly, his support and that of the government of St. Lucia in providing the enabling environment for the pursuit of renewable energy sources amongst the business community, especially the SMEs. The representative from the Ministry of Commerce, Ms. Mose Rosemary Pierre Lewis, stated that the government of the day has put in place a suite of fiscal incentives to help small businesses in taking advantage of the benefits of deploying renewable energy and energy efficiency in their operations. Thanks also go out to Renwick and Company for that sterling endorsement of the craft and at how it allowed the company to revamp its operations, thereby creating savings which has led to increased efficiency and greater competitiveness. I want to also thank the media for their support in covering today's proceedings and we look forward to ample coverage in the various media as we seek to spread the positive word of the benefits of renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, utilization in St. Lucia. I'd like to raise a special thanks to the stalwart CDF team that are responsible for bringing today's forum um, to St. Lucia and to you all. Um, in this regard, I'd like to ask that CDF team to, I, to just stand, Mr. Wayne Vitalis, Dr. Laverne McFarlane, Eugene Williams, Kenrick Burke, Angela Paris, you just raise your hands if you all are here. Um, just to tell you all, thank you very much for the excellent job you all have done in bringing this. It would be particularly remiss of me today not to also thank Ms. Renisha Gentle for the excellent, excellent job she's done as our mistress of ceremony. Wayne, I would encourage you to try and get her on the road for the entire road show. Okay. Finally, a hearty thanks to all the participants in today's forum for your presence and just to say that appointments for field visits, discussions on project ideas or concepts will be done at the CDF table located at the back right of the hall. I believe my colleague, Mr. Williams, already indicated, so I'm just repeating that to ensure that everybody has access to the relevant information. Um, Oh, I urge you to engage the craft personnel here who will be looking at your proposals with a view to moving it to the next step, whether through the provision of technical assistance, which as I said before, is free of charge. In closing, I wish a safe journey back to all of your respective establishments. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you very much for today's participation. Thank you. And before we officially wrap things up, I would like to now call back on the stage Mr. Sumer, who will be giving a very kind gesture to the minister. Mr. Sumer. Thank you very much. And uh, let me just take the opportunity to also extend thanks to all of you for attending and participating so actively. Um, I wish we had a little more time for, for the questions and answers, but um, we have to find a way to allow you the opportunity to get those questions to us because I think answering them is going to be important to ensuring that we have complete understanding and buy-in and we can build on the momentum that we have started uh, today. So thank you very much. Let me just uh, make a brief presentation to, to Minister King. So, so that we um, and officially... Uh, mark our partnership with St. Lucia in advancing the energy transition and also to give him some further encouragement to improve the enabling environment for renewable energy and energy efficiency in St. Lucia. I would like to thank Mr. Suma immensely and to make a disclaimer I think two of the members of the panel here this morning indicated that they are in the constituency of Castries North, blue. Uh, but let me also state that I'm not responsible for all of them being from Castries North. <laughs> Thank you.
And officially, I would like to thank each and every one of you for coming out today and partaking in this very important forum. I believe CARICOM Development Fund has a very good head on their shoulder as it relates to the involvement and the communication process with the stakeholders, business owners, and any other relevant party. I know this is just the beginning and we will be taking this further into other entities and territories within the OECS. And I would also like to thank the panelists here this morning. Thank you all for taking the time out and giving us a lot more insight. I'm very sure our very engaged crowd will be going back home with a bit more knowledge and thought process in getting their entities up and running. Lastly, before I go, I want to also express the very urgent need for forums such as this. I personally would like to commend the CDF in taking the time out to acknowledge the small and medium prize small and medium enterprises within St. Lucia, as well as our women who want to do a lot better and who want to do it in a clean and sustainable way. With that, once again, thank you so much for coming out. My name is Miss Ronisha Gentle, and I have been Mistress of Ceremony for this morning. And we will officially be closing. A gentle reminder one last time, when you go to the back on your departure, we have refreshments that you can partake in. Thank you for joining us here today. All right. Uh, again, once, one more time, just to encourage you to do two things. We are going to set up two, 